Hi, welcome to the Recovery Daily Podcast. I'm your host, Rachel Miller. I'm a stroke survivor and grateful recovering alcoholic. Today I'm talking about challenging negative thinking. Um, I was thinking very much about my thought process and how much I've changed from when I was drinking and now that I'm sober. And when I was drinking, everything was everyone else's fault. Um, All of the things that happened to me were everyone else's fault. I, I wasn't showing up for life. I was standing still. I've mentioned that before. And what I never did was look at things from other people's perspectives. All I could do was look at my life, my situation, and everything that was going on from the perspective of Rachel, the alcoholic. And I didn't even know I was an alcoholic. You know, it was probably obvious to everybody around me, but it was not obvious to me. Uh, because that's what the disease does. It, it, uh, it's very conniving, you know, it's, uh, it tells us things we, we want to hear, you know, instead of, instead of letting us see the things that, that maybe we don't want to see. So, um, I never, I never looked at things from other people's perspectives. And one thing that I learned in the when I first entered the program is the 11th step prayer, which I've mentioned before. And um, one little piece of that is the uh, to understand then to be understood. And that is such a powerful reminder for me. And I try to do that. I mean, I definitely do it weekly. I don't know if I do it daily. I don't know that I interact with enough people these days to do it daily. But when I'm working and interacting with uh, family, friends, strangers, I do make it a common practice for myself to look at things from the other person's perspective. Um. As I've been in sobriety, I have been told uh, by other people, and I know this about myself now, that I can pretty much turn any negative situation into a positive one. And it doesn't happen automatically, and I work at it. It's not something that, that comes easily. I think the more that I practice it, the more easily it comes. Um for Christmas a couple years ago, my boyfriend gave us all a coffee mug with some kind of saying on it. And mine said, find the good. Um, Because, and I was so flattered that, uh, I don't know, just that little coffee mug. I think I've mentioned it in another episode, but it, it meant a lot to me because it meant that he sees that in me, that I do uh, look for the good in everything. Um, At least I try. And I've discussed in previous episodes about what I do actively to challenge negative thinking and try to pause. Uh, I talk a lot about pausing. And so my God box is a big deal for me. Um, And over the years, I don't so much physically pick up the God box anymore. I I don't know that I've mentioned that really. Um, I have this like mental activity now where if I have something that's making me feel angry or something, uh, a person possibly, I always would pick up the the little piece of paper in my God box and write down the person's name and stick it in the box and shut it. Well, today it's more of a mental exercise. And if I recognize that something is bothering me, I mentally 
do that exercise, that I'm putting that on the piece of paper and sticking it in the box. I'm recognizing now, and that was the purpose of the God box to begin with, was to have some sort of physical representation of letting something go because I didn't know how to do it. I've never known how to do it. And when people are like, let go, let God, or, you know, I, you know, I remember growing up, um, hearing, you've got to just get over it. You've got to let it go, you know, things like that. And I, I didn't know what that meant. Um, I know what it sounds like that you need to just forget about it. And how do you do that? I don't think that's, I never thought that was possible to feel very strongly about something and then have somebody say, we need to just get over that or you need to let it go to be like, oh, okay, well, thanks for telling me. Now I will. You know, it's, it's, what does that mean? There's so much happening on the inside for me to, to do that. It's a process. So I uh, used this God box idea to represent what is actually happening. I'm taking something that's bothering me and I'm removing it from where it is right now in my heart and in my mind. I'm removing it and putting it somewhere else because I can't control it. I can't do anything about it. Um, I can't change it. So remove it from where it's hurting me and put it somewhere else. And, um, and that somewhere else has been the God box. So that's how I have begun to understand what letting something go is. I've also started to incorporate the meditation. Um, I, I, I remember one specific instance where I was getting ready to do a presentation for my whole company. And it, you, whoever is from my company that's listening to this might laugh and may not know that I, that I have this level of anxiety. I, it's, it's decreased quite a bit um, since this happened. But Earlier on, when I was um, asked to do a presentation for the whole company, I had a lot of anxiety about it. I didn't have anxiety as I was preparing the material, um, figuring out what I was going to say. Like, I felt very confident in um, my ability. I felt very confident that I was um, smart enough to do it that I was articulate enough to do it, um, where the anxiety lived was the delivery of it. It was this battle of, um, I, I, I didn't know what to do with that anxiety. It would just sit in my throat and you could hear it when I would present, you could hear my throat shaking. Um, and I've talked about that in previous episodes, so I won't go into that again. But as I started to realize that this is something I can learn how to do, just like anything else I've learned how to do, um, I can practice and I can really look at where that anxiety is coming from and do something about it. So one time in particular, I remember, now this was at the beginning of COVID, I think, uh, I remember about a half an hour before I was getting ready to present, I came into uh, what, what at that time was my yoga room, my yoga and meditation room, it's now my office, but um, I came in here and I turned on my salt lamp, I lit a candle um, shut the shades and I just sat and did a, a meditation. I didn't listen to a meditation. I just sat in complete silence and just breathed. And I could feel my heart rate going down as I sat there. And a 
when the time came when I had to actually speak, um, I did a great job. I, I think I sounded, I, I didn't, I don't think, I know I sounded confident, less anxious. So that period of meditation really helped me. And I was fortunate that I was working from home so that I could have my, you know, this, this place where I feel comfortable in my home to do it. Um, but what's interesting and, um, is that later I went into the office and I ran across a couple, a few, uh, people in leadership. And one of them said to me, do you remember what it used to be like when you presented? And I said, yes. I remember, I mean, I could barely, I was a mess. You could see it. I was so anxious. You could see it on the outside of me. And, um, and I was complimented this day for how well I did. And I really was smiling to myself because the reason why I did well is because I put the work in to really get better. It's something I want I've always wanted to do. I've always wanted to be able to stand up in front of, you know, uh, 10 people, 100 people, however many, hundreds of people. I've always wanted to be able to do that and just talk comfortably. And, um, And I'm learning that it's a skill that can be learned. It's not something that either you got it or you don't. Um, It's like any, any other skill that you learn, you know, throwing a, throwing a ball or, or playing the piano, all of these things are skills that can be learned. So, um, and then uh, an alternative to challenging my negative thinking is, is doing the next right thing. So, this I do on a daily basis, especially the past few days where I'm feeling negative. I'm feeling like nothing's going to change. What am I doing? What's my purpose in life? How am I going to deal with everything that is on my plate right now? Like as far as my, my shift in my career or whatever is ahead of me? How am I going to do it? And so feeling negative about that will tend to make me sit still. It'll, it'll, I've talked about it before that overwhelming feeling where you just kind of shut down and don't do anything. And, um, what I've learned in sobriety is All you have to do is take one tiny step towards the next right thing. And then the the next step will follow. And before you know it, you end up doing the thing that you set out to do. And so this morning I was sitting in bed and I had just finished my sobriety meeting and I was taking down my notes for what I was going to talk about on the podcast today and I was done and I shut my remarkable tablet and, and turned it off and, and I just sat there and I was like, it's another day. It's another day. What am I going to do? And I immediately forced myself to think you're going to make bagels today. And I, without even taking another second of spending time in negative thought, I put my feet on the ground and I started walking towards my closet to put on my clothes and I put on my clothes and then I walked towards the bathroom to do my hair and I was putting my hair back in a ponytail and I was thinking, ugh, maybe I should cut my hair off because my hair is getting really long. And then I was like, why do I have my hair this long? Why did I originally want it this long? Oh, because I like to curl it. So what did I do? I got my curling iron out and started curling my hair. And then I was like, well, I can't just curl my hair and not put on makeup. So I put on makeup. So you see what what started as 
ugh, it's another day. What am I going to do today? Turned into me curling my hair, putting on my makeup and getting ready for whatever was going to happen today, you know, not letting life happen to me sitting in that bed, but participating in it. And so I've already gone out and taken my dogs around the block and am preparing to make bagels today. And, uh, and we'll see how it ends, you know, we'll see how it ends up, hopefully with a with a good tasting bagel, I will report back on the next episode. Uh, So looking at the causes of my negative thinking, um, I jotted a few notes down about what are some of the primary reasons that I have negative thoughts. And so this is what I wrote down. Number one, when I don't meet my own expectations, then I'll have negative thoughts. Number two, when someone else does not meet my expectations, then I'll have negative thoughts. Number three, when unexpected things happen to disrupt my plan, And four, when things don't happen on my time. Um, So I feel like those last two are kind of related, but um, this is as general as I could think, the reasons why I feel like that initiate negative thinking. And I thought about uh, what did negative thinking look like when I was drinking? Well, you know, I... All I can think about is when I was drinking, my thinking was lassoed and anchored down to just negativity. And no matter how hard or persistent I was to try to walk in the other direction, it just kept pulling me back, like snapping me right back to that negative negativity anchor. So I just really, you know, the only time I was positive, I remember this clearly. The only time I was positive is when I had at least three drinks in me. And then the cloud lifted and I was able to float. I was able to you know, cut that leash that was holding me towards that negativity anchor and, and fly. And, um, and it wasn't until I passed out and woke up the next day that I found myself not only still lassoed and anchored down to negativity, but it's like that leash like tightened up and I was just stuck right, right against that anchor. Um, So I realized today, now that I'm sober, that my thoughts and my feelings are choices and they are my responsibility. And when I I say that all the time, that my feelings are choices, I realize that when something happens to me, that initial feeling that I get, that initial emotion that happens is not always doesn't feel like a choice. It's, it's something that is a default that exists within me. And that does not feel like a choice. But I strongly believe that that default can change over time. But you have to train yourself to to have a different different default reaction. So um, that takes time. But what I have learned is after a few minutes of, of feeling that default emotion, after a certain length of time, I can't remember how long it is, like 90 seconds, or I, I can't remember how long it is. But after that initial period of time, then that feeling truly is a choice and those thoughts are choices and and we can either sit in that feeling 
and um, and let it mold our our mood, our day, uh, our attitude towards people, places, and things. Or we can make a choice to do something different. And, um, and that's where that doing the next right thing comes in for me. Um, it takes a lot of patience with myself and I have to be gentle and, and by being gentle and patient is it allows me to look at that core feeling and figure out why am I feeling, what is it? that's causing this feeling because you know sometimes we just feel poopy and we don't even know why so my uh, my niece came over yesterday another niece I've got lots of lovely nieces um, so my niece came over yesterday and we were talking about um, I shared with her this idea of feelings being like colors so you have, I have a color wheel and that's because I'm obsessed with, uh, outfits like clothing outfits. And anybody that, that I work with knows that I Google my outfits and, uh, it's a whole, it's a whole story. Um, anyway, I have a color wheel so that I can understand like what are the colors that are complementary towards each other. I know it's a whole big thing. I'm silly about it, but it brings me enjoyment. So whatevs. Anyway, I was talking to my niece about how our feelings are like, or emotions are like the color wheel. And so you have your primary colors uh, red, yellow, and blue. And then you have these secondary and tertiary colors. And so just like our emotions, we have primary emotions, uh, happiness, sadness, anger, um, that kind of thing, fear. And when something happens to me, I have a primary emotion, and let's call it fear. Um, so let's say, for example, that I have a friend who introduces me to another friend uh, of, of hers, and I feel jealous. Like, this is what it feels like to me. I feel jealous all of a sudden, and I give the person without even knowing a look you know like like who the hell are you kind of thing I'm not saying that this isn't a real life example this is just an example I think (laughs) um anyway if I think about okay so I had a primary emotion uh and then I had a secondary emotion and that secondary emotion was jealousy And the jealousy caused me to react in a certain way. And that reaction was, uh, we'll say, being a bitch, (laughs) giving a bitchy look. So if I were to actually take a moment and think about what is the primary emotion that caused that jealousy, the primary emotion is fear. Because I'm afraid that my friend is going to become better friends with that person than me. And then I'm going to have, you know, be left behind or something like that. Abandonment. That's my abandonment issues. So the, if I really practice looking at what the primary emotion is and pause to look at that, then instead of having that jealousy reaction, I can respond to my primary reaction, which is definitely not um, doing anything at that moment. But, you know, if I'm close enough with that friend, I would certainly and humorously say, you know, so who's this? (laughs) So who's this chick or something like that? You know, uh, you know what I'm saying? Like, um, so by having that self-awareness, it 
allows us to start being able to look at what are our default reactions and what are those what's causing those reactions it, it's probably going to be a secondary emotion what is causing that secondary emotion uh, it's either going to be you know fear sadness you know one of those one of those primary emotions so practicing self compassion patience gentleness we can train ourselves to change our default reactions and um and it allows us to to tune into our negative thoughts and seek a different approach to them um i think one of the challenges of negative thinking is accepting what is happening um, as they are and recognizing what we can change and what we can't change. And that's where that serenity prayer comes in. So how do I get around these obstacles that are feeding my negativity? Um, one of the ways that I that I was taking a look at this, an angle of it, is to see what are the trends in my negative thinking. And, and if I look at negative thinking as a weakness, what, what, are, what are these obstacles for me? What's feeding it? So I thought about what my negative thinking was when I was drinking and what I'm still Think, like what negative thinking still exists for me as I am in my stroke recovery. So one of the things that I thought of back when I was drinking was that I didn't, did not deserved, did not deserve to be happy. Um, as much as I don't want to admit it, I feel like there is this underlying fear that um, that I'm just not gonna be happy. I I think that I deserve to be happy, which is different than what I used to feel. Um, that was when I was doing food restrictions because that's I didn't think I deserved to be happy. So the way that I controlled that is through restricting food from myself. Um, I think that that has changed a little bit over time. I think I do deserve to be happy. And I, and I think that's where all this fighting for myself is coming from. Uh, when I was drinking, I thought I'm not like other people. I thought I was unique. And I don't think that I'm unique anymore, but I do, again, have that underlying feeling that I'm not going to be happy like other people. You know, I, I wanted to go as far as I could in my career and make as much money as I could and be as successful as possible. I talked about earlier in this episode about I want to stand in front of a room of thousands of people and be able to talk. I want to be able to be a, a leader. You know, I want the, all of the stuff that I want. Um, I still want that. And And I have this feeling sometimes that I'm not going to have it. And it's, it's, I think, a feeling of retreat, you know, a feeling of uh, just resigning myself to what, what is happening to me. Um, and then s uh, some of my other negative thoughts when I was drinking, I'm not going to be able to do it. And things are not going to work out for me. So these are the kinds of negative thinking that I thought back then. And if I was still drinking, 
I would absolutely be thinking that right now with my stroke recovery. First of all, if I was drinking, I don't know that I would be here to, um, to be fighting for myself in the stroke recovery. But um, I, I can feel those same negative feelings exist like deep within me. And so if I'm looking at these negative thoughts as weaknesses, then that the obvious uh, answer to doing the opposite is to look at what my strengths are. And if I look at my strengths, I can challenge those negative thoughts. So I took some time to write down what my strengths are. These are not only my strengths, but they are also my aspirations, what, uh, what I want to be and what I know I can be. And just the simple exercise, it, it's fascinating. From writing down what were my negative thoughts when I was drinking and what are my negative thoughts now that, are, that seem to parallel what those negative thoughts were, uh, from shifting my, my exercise that I was doing over to what are my strengths and what do I want to be, completely shifted my mindset. Just that simple, excuse me, that simple exercise, drank some coffee, so um, <laughs> that simple exercise of shifting my mindset over to thinking about what my strengths are, like completely turned my attitude around. It's even talking about it, like talking about the negative thinking and talking about my strengths. It's just, it's fascinating how you can almost feel the happy chemicals start, uh, <laughs> for lack of a better word, spewing. That's not what I wanted to say. You can uh, feel the happy thoughts or happy chemicals start um, flowing when you're thinking of your strengths. So here we go. These are my strengths. Um, I'm active. And I think that the the need for me to remain active is what drives me to making sure that I get exercise and recovery. I am uh, brave. And I know that because I got sober. So um Knowing that I've been brave before means to me, it shows me that I can be brave again. Um, I'm calm and patient. And this is a very much a learned trait. <laughs> and I'm continuing to, because I want to be, I want to be calm and I want to be patient. Um, I'm very empathetic and compassionate and sensitive and these, these traits over the course of my life have changed from what I thought were weaknesses to what I know now are strengths. It is only because I'm compassionate and empathetic and sensitive and sincere that I'm able to sit in front of this microphone and say things that I feel deep down within me and that I am vulnerable enough to share so that somebody else on the other end of this digital device can say, yeah, me too. I feel that too. Um, some of my other strengths that I wrote down are that I'm honest, something that I wasn't always when I was drinking. I'm grateful and hopeful. Hopeful is one that I want to be. I'm not hopeful every day, but I want to be. Uh, independent. I've always felt like I've been independent, at least working towards independence. And this is seems like merely a setback of needing to be more reliant on other people right now. But that 
default setting again for me to be independent and want to be independent drives me to continue to try to fight for myself and and be that way. So I'm reflective, uh, personable, and uh, I ended it up with uh, silly and witty. So uh, if I don't say so myself. And um, so so what I'm going to do today is now that I've written down all of these strengths, is shift my negative thinking that started out again this morning with ugh. And today I'm going to make bagels and I'm going to take one of these strengths of mine and work on it. So um, I don't know which one it's going to be right now. Should I have been ready to say that? Maybe independence because I'm going to make the bagels by myself. I'm going to use voiceover on my computer to listen to the recipe and I'm going to make some bagels. So uh, we'll see how it goes. Don't worry, my boyfriend has our stove and oven hooked to the Wi-Fi so that he gets notified when I turn the stove and the oven on and off. So um, that keeps our house... um, safe anyway. Uh, So thanks for listening and uh, I'll talk to you tomorrow.